Uh, kia ora everyone. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. I was going to say on this um, terrible evening, weather-wise, but it's quite nice now. Um, but thank you for coming anyway. Um, my name is Angus Crow. Uh, I'm an executive member of the Wellington Social Society. Um, uh, I, I won't do like a big spiel about the societies. And a lot of people here have come to our events before, but um, we're primarily an educational and, and social organisation. Um, we're spending kind of monthly talks like this on um, socialist politics, theory, practice, um, as well as trying to do drinks and uh, social drinks down, often downstairs at Rogan Valley Bond. Uh, and we have a reading group that we coordinate with the WWEA, Wellington and Workers Education Association. Um, we're part of a large organisation called the Federation of New Zealand Social Society as well. Um, and if you want to pick up our newsletter, there's a um, copies back there. Um, they're $5. Um, you can see me. Or um, if you're interested in joining or going on our mailing list, you can uh, chat to a, another uh, member, uh, or executive member. If you put your hand up, please. Thank you. Um, just have a chat and um, yeah, we'll point you in the right direction. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's kind of it for now. Oh, and we have a little little koha bucket there as well. You did have a couple of coins uh, that you didn't um, need for the rest of the evening. Feel free to put them in there. Um, so I guess I'll introduce our speaker. So uh, Dan McLaughlin uh, writes about politics, economic science and philosophy, mainly in the listener. Um, you may also have seen um, his writings in places like The Spin-Off, who's written, um, well, in, in my opinion, quite a good series of articles uh, on um, problems inherent to state administration, managerialism, technocracy, that kind of thing. Uh, and just generally, like, why things can't get done in New Zealand. Um, and uh, he also um, introduced uh, Kim Hill to the uh, right-wing personality Bronze Age pervert, um, which uh, uh, may or may not have contributed to her leaving RNZ. Um, so, but today he's going to be talking to us about, um, I guess, from what I picked up from this description, I guess a framework that he adopts for looking at society and its problems. Um, it might not necessarily be a socialist or left-wing point of view, but I think it's still something for us to um, consider, and if we don't agree, um, sharpen our uh, critiques um, and our own arguments. Um, but yeah, without any further ado, please welcome Daniel. Thanks. Thanks, Angus. Um, yeah, I, I don't kind of have a good name for sort of this, what I'm about to talk to you about. Um, so if anyone, like, kind of has a, an epiphany, Daniel, you should call this, just shout it out, um, you know, it's, it's blah theory. Um, don't be afraid to interrupt. So I want to start with this quote. Each, each of these is sort of about a thinker or a couple of thinkers and a quote. And so this is this, um, hope everyone can see it behind me. It's, it's an Ursula Le Guin quote. I imagine most people kind of know who she is. She's a science fiction fantasy writer. And in the, an interview with the New York Times, she gives this quote about how um, like we don't, we don't have to sort of accept the systems that we're living in and it's the place of artists and writers to, kind of think, to, to sort of see that and think of new systems. And so she's kind of... And in her view, philosophy is a kind of conflict, sorry, politics is a kind of conflict, and that's kind of the default way. Most of us think about politics as a conflict between political parties or, or classes or, or some other group that's kind of you know, in conflict with each other or acquire political power. And for Le Guin, um, the, the conflict is about systems and ideologies. There's like, there's the bad ideologies, the bad systems, you need to get rid of them, you need to get the good systems, and that's sort of what politics is all about. So. I just want to kind of take a look at that and see if, sort of question whether that's a good way to think about politics. And so, I'm going to start by talking about 
Shakespeare. Shakespeare wrote a play called Richard II quite early in his career, and it's a play that is about divine right of kings. Is this a good political system? And it's the system that he actually lives under. So it's not kind of abstract, it's, it's incredibly meaningful. And it's also quite a dangerous thing for him to be writing about. Um, people are executed for putting on this play during times of political unrest in his lifetime. Because he's only an actor, nobody really cares what he does, so he's never under any threat. His actor's very low status and all this weird thing. But it's, it, is, it becomes a dangerous play. And the basic plot is that Richard II is king by divine right. He's a terrible king. There's a revolution. Henry of Bolingbroke overthrows him. Richard is executed, and um, Henry becomes Henry IV. And for the first half of this play, Shakespeare looks like he is doing what Ursula Le Guin wants him to do. He's critiquing the political system that he lives under. And he's saying, Richard is a terrible king because he thinks he's been divinely appointed, because of the system of divine right of kings. He doesn't have to follow any kind of law. He doesn't have to be consistent. His decisions don't have to make any sense. They don't have to be in anyone's interest. And no one can ever question him. He's just there because God says he's king. And so, that is what brings him down. And about halfway through the play, we get this first quote. Um, I won't read it out. It's from a, it's from a bishop who's, who's kind of saying, this system means that God has put the king there, and nothing can change that. And by this point in the play, we know that's not true, which has basically been deposed. And then, like a, I think it's about a scene later, we get this very shrewd commentary from Richard, who was talking to Northumberland, who was one of Henry's co-revolutionaries. And Richard says, now that you've figured out that anyone can be king, any aristocrat, Henry is good. you're going to think I could be king, and Henry is going to think, no, that you were thinking that. And so you kind of have this, well, now that you've gotten rid of that political system, you kind of have a free-for-all. Any aristocrat can be the king. And this is a perfect description, the second quote, of what political theorists call the Hobbesian trap. In, in a strategic environment with multiple armed ag agents, it becomes rational for everybody to attack everybody else to acquire power. It's, it's hard to not be in a constant state of perpetual war. And so Divine Right of Kings was actually doing something incredibly useful, is the, the point of the play. So by the end of the play, the country is heading into civil war for exactly this reason. Richard decides he has to go, <laughs> Henry, sorry, decides he has to go on crusade because he has to go back to that old system. He has to sort of signal that he is, has divine favor, that he's been divinely appointed. So you kind of have this irrational solution to a rational problem. And this is a way of thinking about politics that starts out in the early modern era, that you kind of have formal problems um, that, that arise from political situations, and so politics, instead of being about a conflict, is about how do we get out of this problem? How do we solve this problem? How do you escape the Hobbesian trap? So there are two problems that, that I, this isn't all, all going to be about Shakespeare, we're going to be jumping to the modern era soon, but, but I'm going to talk about Hobbes and Machiavelli for a little bit. So I have this theory that Hobbes saw that play. He writes Leviathan, and he comes up with this solution which is that instead of divine right of kings, we're going to have this, this bizarre idea in which instead of the king ruling, there's a kind of like an abstract robot that rules, and everybody in the, the land, what, what we now call the state, is sort of part of it. And it's a really hard problem thing to describe, but the weird thing is that we live in this system. We live under a state. The state is sovereign. It's not really in question. You know, our politics isn't about whether we should be a state or not. It's just there. So instead of getting rid of divine right of kings, we kind of just still live under it, but in a very, very strange and abstract way. So I, I always think of that when I see that quote, that actually we sort of still have that system. It's still around, and it's because, in a way, it's quite useful. I think like one would say, why do you have to have like a king or a state as a sovereign? Like, isn't that the problem? And there's a, has anyone read The Dispossessed, the Le Guin book? Yeah. So sure, it's a really great science fiction book, and it's about um, a hypothetical anarcho-communist society. 
And she would say, isn't that the solution to the Hobbesian trap, that there is no centralized power, no one's competing for it, and that, that solves that problem, that gets you out of that? Well, the other thing that, that Richard II, and a lot of Shakespeare's political plays are about, is about the second thinker up there, Machiavelli. And Machiavelli describes another problem. Machiavelli says, he doesn't say this explicitly, this is the most common understanding of his rule. Liberal theorists take this reading of Machiavelli, is that all throughout history and across society, you sort of see this figure emerge in political theatres, the Machiavellian leader. And the Machiavellian leader is ruthless, they're deceptive, they're ambitious, and they're brilliant. And their goal is to take control of whatever society they're in. And so that's another problem, right? Like if you have an anarcho-communist society and a Machiavellian leader emerges, what's stopping them from taking control of everything? There's nothing. There are no opposing social forces. So then, well, Shakespeare is obsessed with this problem because he knows that the, the Machiavellian leader kind of ruins any kind of like utopian ideas you might have. Um, any kind of sort of ideal society, the first question Machiavelli would say is, what's to protect this from a Machiavellian leader? So you end up with you know, the liberal conception of politics, which is the politics that actually about constraining leaders. You have adversarial systems, you have separation of powers, you have you know, individual rights, and this is all to solve this problem of the Machiavellian leader. So that's the sort of, you know, that, that's the problem-based approach to politics, which is that, yes, it's good for writers to kind of think about what's wrong with society and what's wrong with the people that are running it and how you might get rid of them. But there are also these kind of, like, these hidden problems that you sort of need to see, what, see why they're there before you understand why a lot of these systems are in place and that you can't get rid of them without solving the problem. Does that make sense? Okay, so that, that kind of creates the question of what are our current problems? Like, what's wrong today? And I want to talk through these three leaders, possibly not as well known as Shakespeare and Machiavelli. The first guy up there is Robert Michaels, Michels, I think his name is actually. He starts out as a socialist, socialist sociologist. He studies under Max Weber in Germany. And the question he wants to ask, the problem he wants to solve is, why are large-scale left-wing organizations so terrible? Why, <laughs> why do trade unions end up kind of selling out their members? Why do socialist political parties end up kind of becoming moderate and compromising on everything? And the, the answer he comes up with is, is known as the iron law of oligarchy. Mike Michel says, if you have like large distributed organizations, like a, a nationwide trade union or a mass membership party, that's going to end up being controlled by a, a small cadre of people. And they'll, over time, they will become oligarchical. They, they will, and Machiavellian leaders will emerge and take over these organizations. And this is just something, again, that kind of happens almost inevitably, almost inevitably not always. And it's, it's, a, you know, it's another formal problem. Um, I always think season one of The Wire, I don't know if lots of people have seen that, the Baltimore Police Department, it's like the perfect example of an oligarchical organization. There are all the members are kind of on the periphery, are police officers, they're interested in solving crime. The actual management of the organization are just purely interested in promoting their careers. And that means it's almost impossible for everybody who is doing a good job to compete with them because they're kind of making sacrifices on behalf of the organization, whereas the Machiavellian leaders just go right past them and acquire and seize power. And you know, we also, there's also the, the democratic organization in Baltimore, again, like completely oligarchical. Um, sometimes they have to kind of solve problems for the city because there's an equilibrium state that they, they can't be completely corrupt, they can't be completely oligarchical, they do have to sort of serve the people, but not that much. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're quite secure in their position. So the, third, the second person there is, is James Burnham. Um, Burnham was a very, very influential intellectual in the, in the 20th century. He again starts out as a socialist, he collaborates with Leon Trotsky, 
he sort of falls out with Trotsky, and he's briefly a liberal, and he writes this book, The Managerial Revolution, and it kind of adopts some of Michel's thinking. What Burnham says is, um, when people are talking about capitalism or socialism, they're usually thinking about it in a 19th century context. And Burnham thinks that these ideas no longer really work in the 20th century with the rise of mass industrialization, mass society. Um, you can't have like bourgeois capitalism or worker-run socialism anymore. All you can have is managerial capitalism or managerial socialism in which you have large bureaucracies. They might be multinational corporations, they might be massive trade unions or state-run bureaucracies. And these are just going to be controlled by the managers of those organizations. That they're essentially Michel's oligarchs. And once you get into that situation, um, all, of those, all of those organizations are primarily run for the people that manage them, the kind of shareholders of a corporation or the politicians that um, might direct a, a public service. They become quite peripheral, just because of the scale and the complexity in which you know, organizations are operating. So that's, that's um, Burnham's managerial society is kind of, a, I think, a key problem to think about, which is that any, anything you're going to try and do, you're going to be doing via an institution, and the institution ends up being captured by the oligarchs who are you know, managerial technocrats. And you can't really replace them. All you can do is replace them with other people who are more or less the same. You know, if you're going to get someone to run the public service, for example, there's quite a narrow piece, sort of pool of people you can draw upon, and they're kind of, you know, they're all going to be the same sort of people, and they're all going to tend towards the oligarchy. Um, and the third figure there is, is possibly the most right-wing person that's ever been cited in a Wellington uh, socialist society. That's Gordon Tullock. Tullock is um, one of the pioneers of what's called public choice theory. So. Economists have always tried to figure out how do you solve the problem of the fact that a lot of people in modern societies get rich without really creating any wealth. You know, they sort of appropriate it from someone else and Marx would say it's like a, a fundamental property of capitalism. Um, Keynes thought it was something to do with interest rates. He never quite got his idea around it. But, Tulloch and the other public choice theorists develop a very robust way of thinking about this, of thinking about what they call rent-seeking, which is when people use political power or legal power, but usually political power, to just transfer wealth to themselves from, from others, from everybody else. And they do this by starting out with the assumption that actors in political systems, political parties or operatives or bureaucrats, are rational self-interested agents. They're, you know, they're, they're homo economists. They're, they're going to do what's in their own self-interest. And so left-wing intellectuals in the second half of the 20th century absolutely hate this idea. They hate public choice theory. There's a, a funny essay by Amiata said where he says, imagine what life would be like if people actually behaved like this and everybody was just sort of lying and stealing from, from everybody all the time because it's in their rational self-interest to do so. But I've kind of found myself thinking about the public choice theorists more and more over the last three years, especially at the Labour government, when it seemed like a lot of what was happening in the public sector was just perfectly described by them. When there are billions and billions of dollars and lobbyists and major corporations and you know, professional political operatives, you kind of do get this rational, self-interested agent behavior. And um, one of the other public choice theorists, Mansa Olson, describes in a very persuasive way that even if you start out with only one person who is kind of acting like that, and that if they're in an industry sector, one company, if it's a successful strategy, then that has to become the dominant strategy. Because, you know, their competitors can't compete with them, um, and so you either sort of join them or die. So those are the three ideas that I think are really key for understanding where we are now, that our society is run by large organizations. They become oligarchical at the time. Um, they're managerial, they're run by a class of elite technocrats. And the technocrats are increasingly rent-seeking. 
they're increasingly interested in, in using political power to, to just sort of transfer wealth to themselves rather than to you know, create wealth or oversee the creation of wealth. So finally get to some left-wing thinkers here. I don't know, do the Wellington Socialists approve of Piketty? Is he, is he okay? Piketty, um, his most famous book is Capital in the 21st Century. It's an incredibly boring book. It's, Piketty is really interested in longitudinal data sets. And that's important for his work, but it's, I think it's quite boring. So his, his, his big, other big book is Capital and Ideology, which I find really interesting. It's a lot better, it's even longer. But I think it's worth reading. So Piketty brings the concept of rent seeking into kind of left-wing political thought. And because the, the public choice theorists, because they're right wing, when they look at rent seeking, they see trade unions and public servants, which is why the fine intellectuals hate them so much. Piketty says actually, like, rent seeking is ubiquitous in capitalism. And he goes further than that. Capitalism is supposed to be about risk, and it's supposed to be about, what did I say? It's supposed to be about risk and competition. Piketty would say capital and capitalists don't want to be competing, they don't want to be like, you know, having to lower their prices, having to reduce their profits because they're competing. They want to be monopolies and they don't want to be at risk. They want guaranteed returns. And so both of those incentivize you to red seek, to, to hire lobbyists, to change the laws, to establish monopoly power. And so that's, that's this big argument for why we need a wealth tax and quite a large redistributive state is because most of the kind of wealth that is accumulated under capitalism is a form of rent seeking. So they're not really creating wealth, they're just taking it from everybody else. And he actually thinks that if you if you charge really quite ruinously large levels of wealth, you probably get a better capitalist economy because they can't afford to rent seek. They can't afford to pay large political <coughs> donations of white lobbyists. These other important observation is, is not an economic one, it's a political one. I, I imagine a lot of people know this sort of brown and left merchant writers. Everybody. So Piketty and his collaborators build a, a world political cleavages database. And they look at they look at New Zealand, they look at all the other democracies and the OECD, and they see this this really significant change from the 20th to the 21st century. In the 20th century you generally have like a left-wing party that represents Labour and a right-wing party that uh, represents capital. And what Piketty observes is that the left-wing parties in the late 20th and early 20th century kind of get taken over by the managerial class. So the right-wing parties still represent, you know, a certain type of capital, financial capital, real estate, the, they call it the fire economy. I think Piketty uses that phrase, finance, insurance, real estate, primarily rent-seeking sectors. But the left-wing political parties kind of represent the managerial class, the sort of, you know, professionals, educated elites, and uh, their policies kind of shift towards policies that, that primarily reward those classes. So he sort of, he doesn't cite Burnham, I'm not sure who read them, he's read them, but he's sort of wading in the same waters, that this is a problem, that the left-wing parties especially have become captured by this party that, you know, these groups that don't really represent the interests that the party pretends to represent. Um, and the last one is Mazzucato. Again, I don't know, is Mazzucato someone such? Anyway, she's an, an Italian-American English economist. And her idea is, again, she's interested in rent seeking. She says this is a central problem in contemporary economies. She just wrote this great book last year, The Big Con, which is about the role that um, business consultancies play in modern democracies. That there are such as this kind of unelected components of the state that that um, New Zealand, especially in the other developed economies, have outsourced huge components of the public sector, especially policy designed to, to these private businesses, which get to design our policies, and they're paid enormous profits, and they're, they're completely compromised because they have other clients that you know benefit from these policies. They're right. So Mazzucato is kind of taking all of these ideas and looking at them really carefully. As they apply to politics as it's being conducted. And so what she says is that the role of the state shouldn't be to facilitate all this rent seeking, this upward redistribution of wealth. Instead of a socialist state, what she kind of wants is an anti 
an anti-red second state, what Keynes would call a kind of multiplier state, where instead of giving money to you know, vested interests, corporations, business consultancies, kind of collaborated with them to maximize the amount of value that they can create. So she wants to take um, she wants to take the state in the absolute opposite direction that it's going at the moment. So that's her solution to the problem of rent seeking, Piketty's solution to the problem of um, the, 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 the kind of rent seeking capital is the massive redistribution of wealth. So those are the two thinkers that I kind of think are looking at systemic problems in our society and, and coming up with solutions for them. Um, and that, that's kind of the end of my talk. That's, you know, there are problems, um, they're not always conflicts. You can't always solve the conflicts by getting rid of a political party or, or some other ruling class. You have to kind of look deeper and see what's actually happening and what's going wrong, and, and then you can think about how to fix it. So that's all I have for tonight. Um, I think we're going to do, is it a Q&A now, or how's it going to work? Um. Do you want to take five? Should we take five minutes? Can we take five? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Shall I, shall I ask for quick questions now? If some, sure, if so, if something just made absolutely no sense. Does, it, does anyone want to yell at me now? Okay, yes, sir. The last few words you said were how to fix it. I'm really interested in if you've got some ideas. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's not easy, obviously. So, like Piketty and Mark Mazzucato are both quite technocratic. They are fundamentally policy geeks. I think the first thing to do to sort of fix New Zealand politics is get the money out of it and increase the transparency. Um, so, and that's something that has to happen both in the kind of you know political donations, but lobbying, but also our actual private public sector is not very transparent. Some some departments are, but in general, it's incredibly hard to find out what's going on, what's gone wrong, where the money has gone. Um, so yeah, far, far more transparency um, and get the money out would be my first things. If I ran the zoo, that would be the first thing <laughs> I'd do. Start a transparency department. Yeah, yeah. I'd, like no one would go for that, but I'm not <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay, oh, I guess. Well, I mean, if, if you were <clears throat> running uh, an organization, yeah. um, what would you do to ensure that it didn't get dominated by oligarchs, rent seekers, and Machiavellian kinds of society, social society? Oh, if I was running a social. Well, I think, like, Michels would say, you have to have. You have to. It happens at scale. It happens when you kind of can have a small cadre of people who um, who can kind of like devote their entire who, who can successfully kind of run this organization um, and take it over. And there has to be kind of like a, a financial base for them to do that. It needs to be worth their while. I mean, this still sometimes happens in non-scaled um, organizations like. Um, I always think of Michelle's like um, internet forums are quite often taken over by like sort of really crazy dedicated people and who eventually destroy their own forums. So it's like a phenomenon that happens on a small scale as well. Socialist society, I imagine there's this anthropologist Dunbar who has this, this number, 150 people, and he thinks it's about the size of like a sort of uh, an extended kinship group and like you know prehistoric conditions and humans seem to function quite well and you know like lower number and anything above that anything below that number everyone can kind of get along generally but when society kind of gets above that we're sort of outside our sort of evolutionary comfort zone there are too many people there are too many relationships and I, like Michel doesn't talk about that at all because he's writing way before evolutionary psychology, but that, that's kind of what I would suspect, that once organizations happen at scale, that's when you kind of get the, the real problems with oligarchic uh, um, capture. Okay, yes, sorry, one more, let's have one more question oh, and then take five. Right. It's slightly big question. Okay. <laughs> oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah. okay, cool.
Oh, yes. I enjoyed your article on the cluttery, you referred to cluttery? Oh, yeah, cludgeocracy. Cludgeocracy, yeah. sorry, today. And um, just reflecting on my own per you know, experience in public service, do you, do you see anything sort of intrinsic to the sort of New Zealand public sector in which this would sort of come about? Or is this sort of, you you'd see this as sort of universal across like the, the Western world public so, so cludgeocracy, I'm just trying to remember the name of the, it's an American economist, I'm blanking on his name, but his argument is that governments are becoming more and more complex, and they're often being made complex deliberately, so that no one can really understand what's going on. This is an idea that comes from Tulloch, actually, the guy that I referenced earlier, the public choice theorist. He says that, um, you, in, in complex societies, you see the, the um, rise of distributive coalitions, generally, generally between politicians and private sector, or maybe sometimes politicians and public sector. And these are groups that kind of come together because they can benefit each other by it and redistribute some of the public's wealth to themselves. And they might do that by writing the law so it's easy for the private sector to establish a monopoly so they can charge monopoly rents and then that you know, they will donate to the, the political party or the political career of the politician that, that very generally pass, generously passes that law for them. And um, these are always opaque transfers, so they're, sort of, they're, they're complicated. It's hard to see what's going on. And, like, that's, and so over time you end up with a kludgeocracy. You end up with a huge amount of laws and regulations that are designed to not be comprehensible. Um, and but because it benefits somebody to for the public not to know what's really going on is to kind of make sense as that answer. So yeah, and, and I think the example I gave was how um, the government had decided not to regulate forestry splash. You know, on the east coast the forestry sector could just sort of, you know, dump all their rubbish and um, when there was a storm, it, it swept through and just destroyed buildings and bridges, just incredible damage, like hundreds of millions of dollars damage. And that is a classic, like, privatise the profits, socialise the loss thing. And, you know, and the, the politician that was the Minister of Forestry was someone who was really close to the sector. It, it, it was like a classic case of a, um, I mean, that's not a kludgeocracy thing, that's just kind of a sort of classic political corruption thing. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, kludgeocracy is the deliberate complexification of government to, to somebody's profit. Okay. Yeah, so do we do, we do, do we take, take yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, should we say quarter, well, yeah, quarter past. Okay, how long did I talk for? Uh, half an hour? It's probably the shortest talk right? Yeah. <laughs> That was to the point. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, Yeah, I mean, so that was good. That was great. Um, and I think, like, summarized a lot of some of your, yeah, your yeah, work, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, especially yeah. Like, those spin off essays, yeah. um, some of the lists and stuff. Um, and I guess, like, grouping it by the thinkers, yeah. and those, like, three um, problems yeah. kind of helped me conceptualize at least, like, what you are talking about and how you're viewing it, these, the, like, yeah. How you're viewing society and, and the problems in society. Yeah. So that was basically a less coherent version of, of a number of essays I've written over the last few <laughs> months. I guess. Yeah. I guess. So my, my I, I'm, I'm going to like take a style this moment and uh, ask a question for myself. Yeah. Um, but my, my question, you kind of touched on it, maybe a little bit, is like, where does civil society fit? Um, like Bruce Jesson famously, kind of thinks that New Zealand has a very thin society, yep. um, and I, yeah, I just kind of wonder, like, and, and then your the conceptualization of the merchant right from and left that captures like 
the elites and the two main parties, yeah. but then there's this whole other group of people, yeah. or, which I guess we could probably call civil society. Yeah. How do they fit into this the kind of schema that you that you, that you view? I mean, I, I kind of don't know. I sort of um, f feel kind of despondent, really, because I'm not sure civil society has that much agency over this. I was looking at the immigration statistics today and the like, massive inward immigration, but it was about 48,000 outward migration, and that's like 1% of the population of New Zealand just leaving the country. And I kind of thought, like, mate, th doesn't that say something that sort of there is this kind of sclerosis, this stagnation that you can't really change through the political process or, or any other process. So that's my really inspirational <laughs> reply to you there. I do have this idea that you know, that maybe the transparency and the getting the money out of politics that I talked about before, um, that maybe that is possible. Maybe with like enormous effort, you could do something like that. I, I always laugh when people. Um, do, do you think there would be like a society like yeah, driven by Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it would have to be driven by societies. It's really hard to even talk to politicians about this stuff because they all think of themselves as basically decent, honest people. And so, like, the system can't be that corrupt because they've been empowered by it. And so, you know, it's, so yeah, it's really hard to persuade them that they're we should have lobbying regulations. Because they, like, they know the lobbyists, and lobbyists are such great people. Really, <laughs> and they are, because I know these people. And it's because it's their job to be charming. Like, that's the business model. They're really funny, likable, persuasive people. And so it's, it's hard to persuade. And you know, they've risen up through the political parties, and everybody knows them, and everybody kind of gets on well with them. So it's really hard to, to persuade the politicians, actually, these people are destroying the country even though they are funny, charming people, the sort of aggregate effect of them is completely corrosive. So yeah, it does have to come from civil society. Um, I always think when people talk about the sort of the power of the media, and I kind of wish we did have some power. There's lots of journalists are really interested in this, but people don't really read the stories. That guy in Espen did lots of incredible stories about lobbying last year. And, I don't think anyone really read them. <laughs> yeah. and I, I mean, I, I should say this to you, back to you earlier. We had Chloe here, Chloe Schobert speak. The, I guess one of the thrusts was the kind of power of the media yeah. and how, to shape perceptions and, and drive change that way. You know, the media is the message, maybe. Yeah, I mean, she has a bigger audience because she can kind of, she's cross platform and um, stories about her get really good engagement so she can you know she has a bigger voice than any independent journalist except maybe like the political editors of the news organizations yeah um we had like a big question <laughs> was that you yeah, yeah so. i think you actually kind of just touched on it then i right. think i was just going to reflect that i feel like the talk was really interesting and touched on a lot of the important lessons from liberal political theory and philosophy which is you know, that normative theory is important, yep. institutional design is important, and obviously something like orthodox Marxism had learned those lessons mm -hmm. in its, its kind of infancy. Um, of course, then the tradition of Marxism developed in many different directions in the 20th century. However, all of that to one side, I, I suppose in this kind of normative theory, often what is lacking is a, the mechanism for change. Yep. And I think you just touched on perhaps more its the idea that you have the mechanism of how these goals come about, goals like transparency yeah. and getting money out of politics, is narrative change through media and civil society, messaging, media, and social media, and perhaps also, I'm getting the sense, people in policy, so existing technocrats changing their views and kind of trying to change things from the inside. I just wanted to you know, sort of reflect on that more. That's the mechanism you see for reaching those goals. Um, maybe. I mean, one of the, I'm kind of obsessed with like um, the neoliberals as a movement because when we think of their ideas, they were very successful at like, quite a small group of intellectuals kind of affecting a really significant policy change across the developed world. And so that, they did that by, you know, think tanks. Um, yeah, think tanks and then persuading politicians that their ideas were right. So this, 
Like it can be done. Like there's this really, you know, there's a, there's a template for how to do it. I think, um, but I just, yeah, it's, it's hard to do. They have they have opportunity you know, in yeah. crisis. Yeah, that's yeah, that's absolutely true. And it's interesting. And during the COVID crisis, there was a lot of talk about how like, wow, well, this is really a chance to. Sorry, I'm like vibrating there. Um, this is really a chance to change everything. Like this, this crisis could be an opportunity, but there wasn't really a coherent idea of what that would look like and what the sort of policies and institutions were. Like the neoliberals were able to say things like central banks, you want to create this institution and it's going to work like this. Like there was a real policy, clarity to the policies that didn't really exist when people were saying, wow, like maybe COVID means things will be different in some way, somehow. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or it just kind of depresses you a little bit. Maybe, <laughs> maybe both. Hi. Yep, let's go. Yep. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, you know, even from reading, I guess, the first uh, little blurb about what you'd be speaking about, there's obviously some kind of um, disagreement with certain uh, principles of Marxism, I guess, in terms of turning away from, from seeing things about a conflict of class. And so I want to talk to you about two differences you have with the Marxist method. Okay. Um, the first of all is kind of the idea of totality, right? Like, Mar central to Marxism is that capitalist society is one great big totality. We don't have yeah. politics and economics. Uh, separately, we don't have money enters politics, money bleeds into politics and corrupts it, but instead kind of political inequality is economic inequality. They're kind of they're, they're bled into each other. Um, and so that kind of perhaps jeopardizes this like get money out of politics thesis, short of overthrowing capitalism. Um, and yeah, so yeah, that, that's actually all I'll say right now. What do you reckon about that kind of, I think, um, you know, that, that, that's a central thing to me, I guess, with Marxism, that things are not discrete. They're obviously not, they're not reducible to one another. Um, there's contradictions between them, but they're part of the yeah. same totality rather than entirely separate and kind of let's, let's keep them out of one another. I guess, like, uh, Angus is a statistician, so there's the saying that um, one of my stat stats professors said, like really early on, which is um, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And that's like definitely how I think about political theory and that it's useful to know lots and lots of different, you know, like ways to think about it. Cause, and then you can sort of like pick up different models and look at them. Um, I use some ideas from Marxism, like the idea of the base and the superstructure, I think is a really useful way to sometimes think about you know, what's going on in political change and how things are sort of happening, you know, this is the idea that like politics and all the kind of culture is sort of a, a little bit ephemeral and peripheral and what really matters is sort of like the deep economic forces, that, economic forces and technological forces that shape everything and what really matters and to truly really change things you have to change them. I don't, I don't know if that's, in, anyway, I think that can some, sometimes be a useful way to think about things. I don't really think the totality argument, I don't know. I don't think there's a bad thing in the world that is capitalism, and then you kind of solve the problem by getting rid of it. So like, I'm definitely not a Marxist in that respect. Um, I, I sometimes wonder there's an economist, Branko, what's his last name? Uh, Maris, Marcus, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry? My Here's this idea that socialism. Oh, that's the that's the New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. 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 different same first yeah. name and the last name starting with being a bit different. He's an inequality guy. Yeah, yeah. But he has this idea that socialism actually functions as like the precursor system for capitalism, and did so everywhere except in like you know the Industrial Revolution and you know, England during the 19th the, like the, the point where Marx and Engels are writing about socialism and capitalism is like a radical exception to the standard rule, which is that most societies go through the socialist phase before they get their capitalist system sort of bootstrapped and up and running. And, and his argument is that we now see that capitalism is the primary mode of production everywhere in the world. Cap it? Capitalism alone. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's true. Again, it's like a model that you can kind of pick up and look at the world with. 
don't know if that answers the totality question at all. Maybe I've just evaded it by randomly rambling about other things. Um, <laughs> hi. Um, so I just wanted to ask about, uh, you mentioned the sort of managerial capture of organizations over, yeah. say, 150 people. Yeah. Do you think there are other factors that would like contribute to this that we can like look at usefully other than the size and the financial independence of that organization? Machiavelli says you should have like an adversarial quality to your system. If you've got Machiavellian leaders, you want them competing against each other and keeping each other in check. You want term limits, you want separations of powers. Um, yeah, those are his sort of his solutions to that problem of the Machiavellian leader is you can you devise ways to constrain them. Um, because they're really clever, they'll find ways to get around them. <laughs> but yeah, so there's sort of yeah, you're always kind of running in place to try and constrain your Machiavellian leaders. But those seem to be pretty good systems, the adversarial system especially. Politicians hate it, that they're kind of like forced, that they can't just be in power all the time. Like, you know, they have to have elections and they sort of have to, you know, compete against each other for power and they're out of power and they find it incredibly frustrating, which I think speaks really well for that system. Hi. I was, I mean, I, I think a lot of the problems that you've raised sound. Can you speak up a bit? Yeah. Sure. Oh. <laughs> Project more. Um, yeah, I was just saying that a lot of, I agree with a lot of the problem, problematics that Dan was raising. And, and I think they're kind of always going to be with us, and no matter how much we rail against them. Um, but I would just, I don't know, raise a problem with problems, and yeah, yeah. there are, from time to time in history, leaders who arguably fit the bill, psychologically speaking, of what you're describing, the Machiavellians, yeah. sort of the existicals, probably psychopaths, mm. or something like that, but also have quite good portraits. Yeah. It sounds strange, but it does happen, because we think of these people who rise to the top of these kind of um, iron wall of yeah, yeah, systems as being self-interest in the sense of they yeah. want big McMansions and they want to yeah. basically do that as little work as possible, etc. Yeah. Occasionally, it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally you do get people who aren't like that. And I'd give you two examples. One successful. Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> one, going back a bit, who's arguably successful, but I suppose depends on politics, uh, Peter Fraser in NZ. Yeah. Um, and then one that was more recent and not successful, which is uh, Jim Anderson. Mm -hmm. I would say they're both psychologically quite similar, very uh, yeah, aggressive, egotistical, yeah. but they also had quite good policy. I mean, Jim Anderson, he didn't have, to use your phrase, the cabal, you know, the, yeah. he didn't have the cabal around him, he was out of step with history and all that, whereas Peter Fraser arguably wasn't. But, I mean, they were both pretty psycho kind of guys, mm -hmm. but they had good politics. So, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't know, you just have to have, as, I suppose, as you say, that question, you've got to have systems in place that you, know, you kind of choose to choose your psycho. Yeah. We, the more ordinary, yeah. psychologically well adjusted people, choose the psychos, kind of the ones that have got the good politics. I mean, yeah. Yeah, that's supposed to be the role of political parties. And like the our political parties used to be mass movements, like quite genuine mass movements. I think. The National Party had 250,000 members, which like I doubt they've got a thousand now. Maybe they've got a thousand, but there's this joke that if you go along to a meeting of a me like a local meeting of the National Party in your electorate, you come away as treasurer, just because like a, so, and Labour will be much smaller than them. And, uh, you know. Yeah, so that they used to be these mass movements, and they you know, they did have that kind of like that check on who got to take over. Now they really are, I mean, Labour especially, it is this kind of cliques of student politicians that seem to run everything. And, you know, like, I, I had lunch with Chloe Swarbrick in Copperfields a few months ago, and she was sitting there pointing out, like, these people who I didn't know are like the staffers who are the next iteration of that. These are the people who are anointed, and, you know, some of them are now, like, MPs because they were on the list and have been brought in. So they're, they're, there's no kind of like the mass, the membership doesn't really get to say that much about who is running that party anymore. National is a little bit more democratic, but um, 
Yeah, so again, like political parties but are a solution. They're still going to helicopter people in. Yeah. Both have that problem. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I mean, it's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I might just add one for yep, yep, sort of related. Uh, it's also around um, another problem on the problem side thing uh, is around like how, I mean, arguably the Machiavellian types that we're talking about, they uh, push themselves to the fore. Is there not also too just the thing of like there are some people who are willing to kind of do the work to keep organisations afloat? And it's probably yeah. more relevant in the times you're describing where we have no kind of real mass based parties anymore. Yeah. You've just got people who are just willing to do the work to yes. keep things afloat. Yeah. And the, it's not necessarily the decisions are made by those super. who show up. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. yeah. Yeah. So that's maybe a comment for everyone else here. You know, show up type thing. You know, because mm -hmm. a lot of those people who are willing to do the work will, will end up. The Green Party went through a kind of internal crisis. This is a few years ago now. It was kind of run by these like groups of sort of elderly for this, the actual kind of bureaucracy, the day to day, just the work was done by these women who were sort of like, you know, second wave feminists that were elderly and retired. And um, they all became like TERFs. And so there was this like terrible fight within the organization because, you know, they were that sort of generation of feminists that's like a woman or woman. Or, that's like, in the Green Party, that's the worst thing you can be. Like, there's nothing worse than being a turf. But they ran everything, and they eventually quit. Like, they were, you know, they, they all left, and so there was nobody to, like, do the sort of, you know, do the minutes of the meetings or sort of, like, do the accounts or anything like that. So, yeah, you can, yeah, political parties do really rely on these people who just show up and do the work, you're right. There's a, I, I should say another, um, Another really interesting look at the problem-based approach to political theory is Francis Fukuyama wrote this two-volume history of political theory. Um, and the first starts with like pre-human societies, you know, like chimpanzee politics and ends with the French Revolution. And then the second half is French Revolution to today. And he thinks something called the principal agent problem is like a key problem in philosophy and political theory. And it goes like this. If you're like, if you're sort of the emperor of China, say, who do you put in charge of your army? And who do you like put in charge who do you put in charge of collecting your tax? And so you're the principal, but you have to have all these agents and you're gonna kind of be empowering them. And they might become a threat to you, they might be incompetent. So like that is a key problem if you're a ruler. Not if you know like Machiavelli is sort of seeing things from the people's point of view, but Fukuyama says actually if you're a ruler, that's like your central problem who runs everything. And so he thinks that China is a, is a breakthrough because they establish a, a, a the men the bureaucracy, the Confucian bureaucracy is like the perfect solution to the the principal agent problem. Anyway, so as a, his history is kind of a study of different societies finding different solutions to that problem. Um, yep. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to raise a different point of view about neoliberalism. So I don't think so. You've got a fantastic understanding of ideas and Thank you. managerialism related to Thank ideas. You. But I think neoliberalism is about also about struggle. And that by that I mean social struggle, I mean class struggle, but also that includes gender, that includes sexuality, disability, and everything else. So I think that neoliberalism wasn't just a policy change, but it was a, a struggle change, because what happened, we had the biggest strike wave in Aotearoa history in the 1970s and 1980s, and the capitalists hated it. And they felt like they'd lost control of a lot of factories, like the meatworks, where the workers had a lot of control over the, the production process, and they restructured in opposition to the massive wave of social struggle, and that was also anti-apartheid, anti-sexist, anti-racist, all these ferment and polarisation was happening, and neoliberalism was a reaction against that. It was a capitalist counter-revolution. It wasn't just ideas-based, it wasn't just a policy shift but it was actually a transformation within capitalism to restructure capitalism to make it more profitable. And I think that it enriched not just the capitalist class, particularly the financial wing of capital, but, but also a managerial class which has been put in place by neoliberal ideology, you know, public choice theory, that now benefits themselves, not just the capitalist, but a managerial class, whose primary role, and this is what the Labour Party and Green Party and everybody else is doing, and of course in trade unions or not trade unions, is to manage the working parts and to control them and to, you know, you know so that I think, and that's why I think we're in the situation we're in today or the malaise we're in. 
because we just have a huge managerial control over many aspects of our lives, and, and, and that those old solidarities and that class struggle has been broken up. And there's been some movement to, like last, last year was the biggest strikes uh, lost, the working days lost since 1951, believe it or not. So there's glimmers of, of change happening. So I think that, that, that to overthrow this managerial structure and neoliberal capitalism, you need to struggle from below. Yeah, I guess sort of yeah. like the, the term neoliberalism means wildly different things to different people. Um, I, I think it's, there's a book by, what's his name, Hayek, The Road to Serfdom, which is definitely worth reading. Like, um, when you read it, Hayek is like in your mind forever, because it's hard to discount some of the things he says. He, he's kind of like the, the philosophical and economic architect of neoliberalism, and he's writing in the 40s and 50s. 50s and kind of goes a bit crazy towards the end of his life. Like, for example, one of his arguments against a welfare system is that it will always be presented as like a means of delivering social justice, but what politicians will always end up doing is using it to buy votes from constituencies that, you know, um, that they want to vote for them. And like, um, that's what working for families is turning into. You know, we had these incredible um, policies during this election in which, uh, like, something that's sort of supposed to be a welfare system for, you know, the working poor has sort of become this massive middle-class wealth transfer system, um, which, which works really badly for the poor for various complex reasons, which I'll get into. Um, so, like, the neoliberal theorists are quite perceptive in some ways. That's kind of what makes them made them so successful, they, they went wrong about some of the problems that come up with, you know, that sort of Keynesian model. Um, I think New Zealand had like the worst neoliberal revolution, like the, the most incompetent and the most corrupt politicians, which sort of makes it hard to, to say some of the ideas were worthwhile and interesting and important because we didn't really get you know, we didn't, we didn't get any of the good stuff, we just got the kind of the evil stuff. Um, yeah. I, I guess that just to, on Toby's point though, of that, um, the links between people, between working people, um, and when we're talking about uh, my question about civil society and, and say getting money out of politics and the civil yeah. society yeah. movement. Where is yeah, yeah, society? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that that I guess that's been like dissipated and yeah. smashed by by capital in yeah. that period. So yeah. I don't know, I just want to reinforce that. <laughs> there's, this, there's this theory some um, feminist theorists have, which is that civil society oh, kind of gets destroyed when um, women move into the workforce on mass because they sort of the people that really ran the unions and the churches and that all of that kind of organizing power just goes into you know into the workforce um, and so there's no kind of coordination no one's coordinating what used to lead to those mass movements i don't know if that's true it's interesting you know it's another model to throw in there but yeah hi i listen with interest to your attribution of certain views Machiavelli, but I am having some trouble locating those views in his actual works. What is your source within Machiavelli of the views you have attributed to him? So, uh, has, it, has anyone read The Prince? I'm assuming that it's like, it has this reputation for this really like dangerous book that will kind of teach you how to be evil in it. Like, it's the kind of thing real estate agents read to compete with there. And it's all like, here's how, to, here's how to deal with an unruly bishop. And here's how to absorb new, um, new territories into your principality. Like, it's, it's, you know, an early Renaissance work. Um, so, like, there is a, a liberal interpretation of Machiavelli that kind of comes from, and it starts in Shakespeare. Um, there are also letters that Machiavelli wrote. There's a famous letter to a friend explaining that the prince is a satire and saying, I can't remember the quote, if I, I'm not teaching people to do evil, I'm teaching people to recognize the evil that this person does in the world. 
So yeah, that's, yeah, like I say, it's so, some of it is from um, the discourses on Livy, where he goes into a lot more detail about how to build a, a political system that's kind of resistant to the Machiavellian leader. But yeah, if the, the prince is a kind of, I, th I think the prince is a satire. It's, um, it's a version, there used to be all of these books called Mirrors for Princes, like, um, that were written by Christian intellectuals at the time. It's given to sort of young aristocrats, here's how you be a perfect Christian prince. And so most Machiavelli scholars think that he's writing a satire of this, those books. And he's saying, here's what actual princes are like. You're never going to get these perfect Christian princes. They'll be killed really early on um, if they behave the way these intellectuals are telling them to behave. I think um, the first book, the first season of Game of, Game of Thrones is like a kind of, you know, it's, it's pure Machiavelli. It's like, here's this, you know, Sean Bean's character, I can't remember their names. Here's the noble king, here's the wise king, and he's just killed almost immediately. <laughs> and that's a very Machiavellian thing. If you try to live up to these moral standards, you're just, you're just not going to make it. Um, does that sort of answer that? In a kind of vague, rambling way? <laughs> I had to be offensive, but what you've just confirmed for me is what I suspected. And that is, you don't actually know much about Machiavelli. Okay. Is there, should we have one more? I need one more. Hey. Or, I will take two more, because I'll like it. You're going to do, okay, go over here. Um, obviously, you got uh, jockeying within both your managerial capitalist classes, Venn diagram overlap between the both, but they're separate entities. Um, how do you see that represented within the changes post-election? I guess if you're starting with a, a basic idea that the change from Ardern to Luxon is greater than the change from uh, English to Ardern. Yeah. Um, I've, I've come oh, to... the people on top yeah. give less of a fuck about firing 8,000 people because they're still on they're still in charge. Yeah. But it's quite a reframing of um, the state. I don't know, I've been thinking about that all day actually, about whether, so we've had this kind of long centrist regime of, kind of late Bolger, Clark, Key, English, Ardern, and like ha have we now moved beyond that? Have we sort of had a real break? And we're now in uncharted territory with like a really right wing government? Like maybe, I'm not sure. Something I've been thinking about quite a lot is when Clark comes into power in 2000, the business sector has just kind of a nervous breakdown. Like, they call it the winter of discontent. It's just this, like, sort of year-long temper tantrum, essentially, of how this, like, crazy socialist has seized control and is destroying the economy. And, and I kind of do wonder, like, and, you know, the Clark government sort of um, quickly made friends in the corporate sector and sort of pulled back some of their policies, which were causing the business sector to freak out. And so, I think there's like a possibility that that's what happens with this government, that they, you know, start sitting down every week with the EU leaders forum and um, Winston Peters loses interest in replacing the principles of the treaty and legislation and Seymour's referendum bill just gets killed in select committee and the, the, just as sort of as a continuation of business as usual. Or it might not be, it might be like genuinely quite a radical break and I, yeah, I don't know which is... Does that, does that, is that the question you were asking? Or? Kind of, it's right. more just the whole, the realignment within that. Uh, and I guess we have to wait and see. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I don't want to impose my name. I just think there's like, there's the quick things that they can do in the first hundred days or whatever. And, and so we're seeing that with getting rid of FBAs, um, dual mandate, reserve bank, that kind of thing. I guess it'll be, this, and it'll be, can they push through another agenda? Um, can, can they actually do it? Do they, do they have the attention span? Yeah. Can they get the stakeholders on board? All that, all that, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and a, and a three-party agreement, yeah. which might be difficult. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if that's really much different than what he's doing, but. I just follow on from that. Yeah. I guess the other, the other point in terms of uh, Seymour and um, Peters, 
is it possible they represent uh, more of a classical sort of way you see your petty bourgeois interests? Are they aligned with the, the merchant right? What's their relationship? I mean, I think ACT is like the vanguard party of the merchant right, right? Like, um, I, I asked, there's this idea that ACT and New Zealand First are kind of sort of swimming in the same waters, that they're appealing to the same um, constituency, and I asked Dan Seymour about that, and he said, like, as far as we can tell, it's just not true. Their voters are completely different to ours. There's like a really small crossover, but we're, you know, our voters are really well wealthy, and theirs aren't um, in general. So yeah, I, like, I, yeah, I think ACT is the vanguard of the merchant right, and um, that's why they're leading the workplace reforms, and that will play really well to their, their donor class and their constituency, which is kind of the same thing. Um, New Zealand first. I have this, I have this theory that there's this kind of like, just real, really strong conservative, small c conservative demographic in New Zealand that wants to vote against ACT and the Greens, and they primarily vote for New Zealand first to kind of block them from, from taking on a, a role on, you know, from being part of a coalition government that does sort of disempowering those two radical parties. I don't know, if, you know, that's true. But that's my that's my grand theory of New Zealand First. But I mean, New Zealand First is also like it's it is the most hypocritical party in Parliament because it sort of pretends to be speaking on behalf of the little people, and a lot of their constituents are quite poor. But it's 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 funded by the richest people in the country, and the real estate industry, and the racing industry, and the fishing industry, and the forestry industry. So you know, and that's uh, I guess in that sense they are sort of a merchant right party, but they. That's not who their that's who their donors are, but it's not who their constituents are. All that and the best name that can come up is the New Zealand First Foundation. Yeah, yeah. Amazing story. I think we had one last question. Yeah, I think it was oh, yeah. So a Scotch question you asked this. Um, <laughs> what's the most important thing you learned from the Greenpeace? Um, both who see bigness and complexity as a barrier to human freedom. Wendell Berry, he's the guy, he lives in like a cabin, doesn't he? He's the, yeah, yeah, the, the guru of, I can't remember. Yeah, I exactly who to ask that question. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, so I've, I, I have read some of his essays, um, but I, and Reginald Crow, I don't think I've ever heard of, but um, if anyone wants to tell me about him, then they're, they're, free, to, they're free to do so. Yeah, no. Okay, I think. Okay, very last. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what do you want to be writing about in the next couple of years? Um, that's a really good question. I've just written an essay about my dog, but it's possibly not going to be like a continuing theme. What I, what I want to be writing is um, you mentioned Jesson and the Finn Society, and so I think that's really true. Jesson had this idea that. New Zealand, or Pākehā New Zealand at least, gets a state before it gets a civil society. And so that means we've always been this supposedly sort of thin society. And I, you know, there's no, this sort of like, um, how should I put it? There's no kind of, there's no rel big religious movement that can kind of act, act as a counter to the state. There's no like sort of strong sense of geography um, the way you might have. And, other you know, developed constituencies, like the US has the South, for example, and, you know, who are often in opposition to the, the, you know, the central state. We, we don't really have anything like that, and I think that's very really true. So that's kind of something I'd like to write about in terms of New Zealand's history, because um, Pearson thought it was why we had such a kind of catastrophic neoliberal revolution, because there are no other social forces that could stand up to them. So, once, a, once quite a small number of individuals can capture treasury and the cabinet, they can do whatever they like. Um, yeah, that's, that's the thing that I'm interested in at the moment, I guess. Okay, well thank you very much everyone. Good questions, mostly. <laughs> Thanks, Angus. Yeah, no, thank you, Dale. Um, we've got a small, uh, no, I guess. You said you don't drink that um, for your wife. Yeah, she, she drinks. She drinks a lot. So that was, uh, <laughs> and uh, copy the okay. newsletter as well. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, it's very, so yeah, it's still very you can you can find out who the uh, sanctioned um, no, right. thinkers are. Yeah, <laughs> it's very professional newsletter. Um,
Yeah, uh, and just thank you everyone again for coming. Um, uh, this is probably our last educational event for the year. Um, I think we're probably looking at this stage back again in February. January's a bit of a road off in London. So, um, I guess Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, all that, Happy Holidays, um, and safe, be safe. Yeah, see you, in, see you in the New Year. We don't see you before. Then.